Several months ago, Toxin Magazine interviewed you to learn a little more about who Reverend J.D. Jackson Jr. really is. And during that conversation, we found out a lot about your father. We found out that your father's church was bombed 50 years ago. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, in indeed, it was 50 years ago. Um, Thanksgiving Day uh, 2021 marks the 50th year anniversary of when that took place. Um, when that took place um, at Mount Vernon Baptist Church, the corner of Joseph Avenue and Upper Falls, there was also a Muslim temple that was also bombed. Um, to this day, neither one has been solved, but uh, there's all kinds of rumors about who did it and why, but again, not resolved. I remember when you told me that story, I just went into research mode. I just went like, I want to be a part of this story. And I called you like, JD, we have to tell this story. And you were like, come on, let's do it. Why did you trust me with being able to tell your father's story? Well, seeing your work and having been interviewed by you, um, I, I knew you were the one to, to do it. So I'm just happy you got excited about it and agreed to do it. So. Um, I think we'll have a, a, a wonderful thing together here, um, telling the story, getting the word out. Well, I'm excited to be a part of this project, and I look forward to everything that comes with it. All right. Thank you so much. First and foremost, I want to thank you for joining me. Now, for those who may not know who you are, could you tell me who you are and your connection to Reverend J.D. Jackson, Sr.? So I'm uh, Bill Johnson, the former mayor of the city of Rochester. And I got to know Reverend Jackson when I came here to be the head of the Urban League in the 19, early 1970s. Now, could you tell me something that we may not know about Reverend J.D. Jackson, Sr.? Well, Reverend Jackson, like many of us in Rochester, uh, emanated from the South, uh, really from the Deep South, Louisiana. And um, he had that style about him, what I would call an old fashioned Baptist preacher. So he preached in a cadence that people loved, uh, but he was also a very down to earth, folksy person. So, you know, his, his ministry didn't just extend or was contained in the walls of Mount Vernon. He was well known throughout the community um, he greets you like, you know, like he knew he had known you for years. Just, just that kind of person, beloved by his congregation and beloved by a lot of people in the city. Could you tell me some of the things he, were, he was doing in the community? Well, uh, let, let me go back and say that Mount Vernon had a very um, 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 tragic kind of a occurrence in the 19, early 1970s. The church was bombed. This was uh, only a few years after the riots, and there were a few. This wasn't the only building that was bombed in the city. It's something that people don't really talk about today and remember. So they were out of that church for about five years and actually worshiped up the street uh, at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, so because of that, uh, and Reverend Jackson came here in 66, which was two years after the riots, uh, I think that he understood the role uh, of social ministry. Uh, and he knew how to translate that. Uh, so he was involved uh, with er organizations like the Urban League, uh, like ABC, uh, and others that were more church related. You know, they have all of these uh, Baptist conventions and everything. So he used uh, his, his knowledge and he used his Southern background to really become much more of an activist kind of a pastor than, than he might have been otherwise, and which some other ministers in town were not. Now, what do you remember about the bombing of the church? Well, I wasn't here. Okay. That was in 70, I came in, I came in December 72. Uh, what I know was that he had this big building sitting on, on Joseph Avenue, uh, you know, which was for all intents and purposes boarded up. Um, and um, they, they worked very hard. They raised money uh, to get that church. It took them, as I say, almost five years. And I remember when they went back in that church um, in late 1975. Um, so I, I I know that uh, you know it did not break the spirits 
of the members of that church, they were determined. They were not going to go look for another building. They were not going to, uh, um, you know, shut down. They were going to come back, and they've come back very strong. Now, when you think about tragedies like that, and you being the former mayor, had you ever looked into the bombing of the church? Because it was never solved. It wasn't. <clears throat> and I can't really speak to what happened during that, that time. These dicey times uh, in Rochester. You got to remember, and this is, I get, I get most of this from what I've read and from talking about people who were intimately involved. You know, the riots in the Rochester in 64 shook up the, the white establishment because they had been very proud of themselves that they had this so-called progressive city. Um, and they had, a, up until the 19, early 1960s, a very sm a small black population, all jammed up in two sections of the city, you know, Third Ward and Seventh Ward, that's how people were identified. And now all of a sudden, this thing sort of um, reveals some 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 sort of kind of things, you know, poor housing condition. There were reports documented, you know, that a lot of people were migrating from the South and coming to Rochester. There was not adequate housing for them. People were being put in one family, what were built as one family homes, three and four and five families living there, not adequate facilities. And with these reports were coming out, and they said, Oh, that's not Rochester, you know, you know, we're better than that. So it took the riot to really shake up the establishment. And um, in the aftermath, there was still tension because fight, Reverend Florence was still very, very active. Um, there was a lot of tension and a lot of people had to really be brought to understand that this, this Rochester that we, they were so proud of was really a myth and not a reality. Um, Reverend Jackson was one of those men, he had this kind of soothe way, you know. So if you look at, and I wasn't here, I know these players, I know Minister Florence, I worked um, alongside Minister Florence on some issues. Jim McCullough, who was head of ABC. These were very, very uh, determined, uh, but fiercely determined, a uh, black man, and they weren't going to take no for an answer. So you got people cringing at that style. And then you have the diplomatic style. This is what I would say about Reverend Jackson, because he charm, he could charm a snake. And I say that <laughs> with a tremendous amount of respect, all right? Just soothe, and next thing you know, he's got you talking about something that you really didn't come there to talk about. So you had that style, and I think that he was a very strong transition figure uh, through, that, through that period of time. And then I came afterwards when things had pretty much calmed down, but he still played it played an important role. Mount Vernon is a big church, and, uh, and, Re and Reverend Jackson, you know, brought tremendous leadership there. Well, and, you know, people, they're members of that church today who compare to any minister that comes to Reverend Jackson. Can they meet, you know, his, uh, his standard? Now, tell us something, maybe three words that would best describe the Reverend. Um... Calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> Is there anything else you think we should know about Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr.? Well, let me just tell you this one little anecdote. Um, you know, the process for renaming a street in Rochester is very, very difficult. And it's made that way deliberately. So it requires, in order for you to change the name of a street, you have to get 75% approval of the residents on that street. Uh, so there was a move after Reverend Jackson died, members of the church petitioned the city, I was the mayor at the time, to change the name of Joseph Avenue to Reverend J.D. Jackson Boulevard or Avenue or what it was. They had to go through that process. Uh, the process is complicated by the fact that in, in along that stretch, there aren't many buildings, but, but there are housing complexes which have hundreds of residents in them. Technically speaking, all of those residents would have something to say about the rechange of uh, the street. And then as you go further north, and you further further away you get from the church, it becomes increasingly more difficult. All right? Uh, finally, I had to settle on a compromise to name the area between, uh, of Joseph Avenue, from Upper Falls, which is just north of the church, down to Baden Street, which is just before you get to Antioch. 
Okay. So that's that's that was a compromise. A lot of people didn't did, didn't appreciate it. Thought that we should get more, but we couldn't get the seventy five percent approval. We couldn't wait. All right. Um, but I think that um, Reverend Jackson <laughs> did achieve something unique. There aren't there aren't many streets in uh, in the city named after people. There is no George Eastman Street. There is no Frederick Douglass Street in Rochester. All right. There is a Reverend J D. Jackson, part of the street in Rochester, and I think that that reflects really how the stature that he had, you know, uh, in this community. May Mayor Warren, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, yes, uh, we have both grown up in Rochester, <laughs> New York, and uh, we have a lot of uh, history mm -hmm. in Rochester. We've seen a lot of things happen. Um, but uh, some of our pioneers in Rochester that mm -hmm. have gotten things done over the years, um, you and I both know about those folks, and we have one specifically in mm -hmm. common that I'm thinking about, uh, David Gant. Yes. Uh, David Gant was a good friend of my dad's, and you know, I, I'm just wondering if you could kind of speak to the um, relationship that was there and some of the things that, that David did in your relationship with David. Yes, well, your dad was his pastor, um, and he loved him dearly, um, was very saddened when your father passed away. Um, you know, David was like a father to me, so uh, he brought me up in the political world, and, um, you know, faith was his foundation, and um, he was a member of Mount Vernon until uh, he passed away and uh, continued to support the work uh, through you know offerings and an annual scholarship um, even after your your dad passed away he would often talk about um, how your father was so in tuned with education and wanting to make sure that every child in the city of Rochester got the education that they deserved and so that's why when the educational center was being built at Mount Vernon, uh, David went to the state to get some dollars to support that and was very, very happy about continuing on your father's legacy um, even after his, his passing. Yes, great, great. And I, and I had forgotten about the educational piece uh -huh. uh, with the educational facility there, but one of my uh, connections with David, you know, of course, being uh, mm -hmm. also a member of Mount Vernon, yes. um, he helped with the renaming of the street mm -hmm. um, in front of Mount Vernon. And, yes. You know, he and I worked together in, in, <laughs> in the trenches there. I don't know if uh, you can speak to that a little bit. Yes. Well, you know, because your dad was so influential in, in the community, and um, from the time he got to Rochester, right, um, really um, working with the not only the political leadership, but the faith community, with the community at large. We know that Northeast Rochester uh, was one of the most challenged parts of our city. Um, it's where the race riots happened in 1964, and um, your dad came right after that. And um, so it was in a time when we were rebuilding. And uh, David was really, really um, a part of that rebuilding and making sure that communities of color got the support and the advocacy that they needed. And your dad was definitely a part of that. And right there leading the charge uh, alongside uh, Minister Florence and others. And uh, so when it came time to uh, rename the street, working alongside you and your mom, um, he would have found nothing better than to really pay homage to a man that had did so much for our community. Uh, your father coming from the South, yes. understanding the challenges that um, that were faced not only in the South, but also in the North was something that uh, neither one of them ever forgot. David was from, uh, was born in Alabama, but came uh, to Rochester uh, from Florida. And so very understanding of the challenges that uh, communities of color uh, faced um, and continue to face to this day. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that walk down memory lane. <laughs> yeah, you, you uh, brought back to my memory a lot of uh, things that, that went on between you know my, my dad and uh, mm -hmm. David Gann and all of the, the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, with the riots in 64 and you know we got here in 66 mm -hmm. you know I was just a baby at the time but yes. uh, you know 
I am fully aware of that, that <laughs> history. So, so thank you so much for that. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to, to add to uh, yes, the story? Yes, actually, um, there is something that I wanted to add. Um, I wasn't mayor when your dad was, um, was pastor of Mount Vernon and leading our church and all the work that he did. Um, but I do understand that we are going to be celebrating uh, what would have been his 100th birthday. Yes. And um, I wanted to present to you on behalf of the city of Rochester in, in the legacy of your father in memoriam, the key to the city. It's the highest honor a mayor could bestow upon one of its citizens. And I could not think of a better tribute at this time than to pay tribute to uh, the late Reverend Jackson and provide him a key to the city. And if you don't mind, I'd take a moment just to read it. Yes. Um, it says, Reverend Julius David Jackson, Sr., born October 29th, 1921, earned a legacy as a spiritual leader called by God, who served his country with dignity during World War II, then dedicated his life to pastoring churches. Reverend Jackson faithfully pastored Mount Vernon Baptist Church in Rochester, New York from November, uh, from November 1966 until May of 1992. After a Thanksgiving Day bombing in 1971, Mount Vernon was victoriously rebuilt in six years with his guidance. Reverend Jackson also filled numerous leadership roles within local and national church organizations. In honor of it, what would be his 100th anniversary of the Reverend Jackson's birth, he is forever remembered by the city of Rochester for his steadfast devotion to the people of Rochester. So Thank nice. you for Thank sharing you your so father much. with us. Thank you very much. Blessings. Thank you. You're welcome. First and foremost, I want to thank you for joining me. Could you tell me who you are and how you're connected to Reverend J.D. Jackson, Sr.? Well, thank you for having me. My name is Thomas Warfield. I'm the grandson of Robert E. Warfield, Sr., who was the pastor of Mount Vernon uh, prior to Reverend Jackson. And um, our families have been sort of intertwined ever since. My grandfather and uh, my family were the ones who moved Mount Vernon to its current location on Joseph Avenue, the building where it is now, uh, back in 1955. And so um, it was uh, my, bro my father's brothers and my father, they all grew up in that church at Mount Vernon. Uh, they all sang in the choir. Um, many people are, remember uh, William Warfield, my oldest uncle, who uh, was known for singing Old Man River in the movie Showboat. Mm. And uh, my um, other uncle, Thaddeus, was the music director of Mount Vernon from that time in the 50s all the way through the mid 90s, uh, overlapping uh, Reverend Jackson's time as pastor. Oh, wow. Now tell me one of your most vivid memories of Mount Vernon. Well, I don't have a lot of memories of Mount Vernon, however, because I was a little kid really at that time, but um, I do know a couple of interesting stories about the early times of Mount Vernon uh, when they moved to the building where they are now. Um, they moved, uh, they had the dedication of that building in 1955, I believe in the late fall. And my uncle Thaddeus, who was the music director, he married his wife Blondine uh, in August of 1955. So uh, they hadn't actually moved into the building of the church yet, but they did allow them to have the wedding there oh, wow. before the dedication. So that's pretty cool. And then actually for the dedication, uh, my uncle William, who was then married to Leontine Price, they both came for the dedication of the church and, uh, and helped to kind of uh, secure the, um, uh, the church's mortgage uh, so that that building could stay where it really is now. Now, do you remember the bombing of the church? You know, I don't remember the exact bombing of the church. Um, I was probably nine, eight or nine years old. Um, but I do remember the community coming together to help the churches that were bombed. Um, I remember my father's church. Um, uh, he was minister of music uh, in a different church. But I remember they were kind of were getting money together or, and things together to help. Uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, so there was definitely an outpouring from the community to um, help during that time. So I do remember that part of it. So what's your relationship with Reverend J.D. Jackson Jr.? So uh, Julius and I go back, I think 
I, I wish I could even remember how we seem like we've known each other our whole lives. But I think it's probably like maybe a high school time or just after high school or somewhere around there. And we've been friends ever since. And uh, well, I'm a musician and a dancer. And so I often perform at his church or do things at, at events that he's putting together. So we've worked together a lot over the years and we've been very close uh, our whole lives pretty much. So when he asked you to be a part of his father's documentary, what did you think? Well, first I thought, wow, is it really a hundred years <laughs> that your dad's going to... It just seems like yesterday that his father was pastor. Um, so I was really honored and um, anxious to kind of put the little Warfield piece in there uh, because it's a very important part of the two families' life at Mount Vernon. So what do you want people to know about Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr. or Reverend J.D. Jackson Jr.? Well, you know, I think um, the junior has carried on his father's vision and um, mission of community building, of uh, working and serving the community. And so I think that's really beautiful um, to be able to see that, it, like his father's legacy is still ongoing through mm -hmm. Julius. And so it's pretty evident throughout this community. Yes, I agree. So thank you for joining me. Could you tell me who you are and what's your connection to Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr.? What was, not what is, asking me because he's, <laughs> <laughs> right. he's gone on before, but he was my everything. You know, he was such a good husband as far as I know. Such a good family man, in other words, I'd cut it short. Good family man, and he was just dynamic. Anything was, is nothing too hard that he couldn't take. Go on, we said, son, we want to go pray, talk to God. There's nothing too hard for him. And we, he just handled things, be honest with you. I, he oftentimes, even my wife, Sometimes don't understand because see I was like the, who that was I can't call his name but going down Damascus Road I'm pretty sure you read mm -hmm. uh, what his name was but anyhow he was a man if you say something about Jesus that he would arrest you and deal wrong thing don't have gone down to Damascus to go to those people who was doing things and he wasn't he didn't know the Lord. And God had knocked him. I see that I was in the in the in, in the world and off the world. Okay. And now, what do you remember most about Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr.? He's just his, his thing is to get children, bring people to God. Yes, to bring people to God to visit the sick, because as recently I stopped visiting the sick. He liked to visit the sick. He liked to go, if you call him what, don't matter what hours at night. Okay, boy, I'll be there. One thing with him, don't call, you never get grown. <laughs> he he, he always call you, boy. <laughs> you know, but uh, he's just a sweet guy. Come to us, and he's not, he's just very, very intelligent man. You know, like some, think about more themselves more than, but he's just flexible. So tell me about the first time you heard his sermon. That was the first time. Mm. That was the first time I heard him preach. First time I went to church. And it's his first time, I, that's my church room, I ever have had a church. I had visited the church, like with weddings, or I like to go to watch night service and things like those, but after that, just drop that, do my thing. What type of relationship did you have with Reverend? Very close. Okay. Very close relationship, very close. Like we're going to pray for the sick or go to the hospital. He called me deep, we're ready to go. We're going, I want, can you go? I have anything you don't know, can you go with me? Are we going out some, you know, visit him and I stay with him till I stayed with him till he passed. 
stay with my best as I love it. And right now till I promised the wife as a sister Jackson, because she and my wife is very close. Ooh. You know, oh, that's how come I get to know. Him. She called me the last night. Her sister is here, you know, so she called me and let me talk to her sister. But Tom um, Reverend Jackson is a man of God. A man, he have the word. And see, just like I told the deacons and we had these meetings, I said, no more Reverend Jackson. I would say, there's no more Reverend Jackson. I don't know if there's going to be another one like him. So we just want to table that, you know, and then the Lord lead us to get someone. Now, when Julius Jackson Jr. contacted you about the documentary he's doing right now, what, what did you think? Why did you want to be a part of it? Because I know a lot about him. Uh, be with him, we travel together, I just enjoy his preaching and just enjoy anything. I just always tied up, tangled up in the church. I sing in the male choir, I'm on the board. I, I look over the church property, we get someone cut the lawn. Just and, and just go to Rev Rev and I have meetings and the appointment. And he just was just a, not no guy that, you know, overlooks no one. He don't believe in un, overlooks no one that I love with Rev. And you can call Rev at any time. Now, what do you remember the most about the bombing of the church? Very little, because like I told you, I never went to the church till after it bombed. Okay. Then we go there because I, I you know, my, my wife was a member there. I met her and she, I told her I was no church member and I wasn't. But was, you ended up getting married in the I church, I married right? her, yes, and that is almost 40 something years. Oh, now. wow. Now, when I when you think about Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr., tell me some of the words that come to mind. Well, I don't, uh, be honest with you, he was very, very friendly. When we have a discussion or something happens in the church, and he's the first one so far for the years I've been in church, I can see he never get upset. He said, boy, we're going to get together. Don't you get upset. Don't you worry. Let's table it. Let's sit inside. Because I remember not going to explain what happened. It was a big thing that happened. And, and, and uh, he said, no. And some of the deacon and the trustee, it was mixed up. Said that if we don't, don't get it together, the ship is going to go sink down. And Reverend Jack said, boy, don't you ever say that. Ain't no ship going on unless God put it down. Mm -hmm. So we got that meeting the night and everybody was just with their toe mashing the shoes. I was a little there, really too, you know. And it, it turned so calm after we have prayer, a scripture and prayer. It done so calm, everybody come out smiling. Now tell us something we may not know about Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr. Well, be honest with you, uh, he, I didn't know what the sickness was, even his sickness, but because friend, I know him, I know he always have a head cold, like, you know, what we need. But he just, he just a, a man of God. Yeah, he just a man, a spiritual sent by God. You know, because I'll be honest with you. I know we cannot get, I don't think, which is not impossible. That really don't, he's not someone like him. Humble mm -hmm. and, and full of the spirit and good teacher, good preacher. That's what we are looking for now. It got to be a good leader. Okay. To have a good follower. Because right now, you know, it's rough. It's rough on the board. But I, and I just had to think about Reverend Jackson every time. First and foremost, I want to thank you for joining me. Now, can you tell me who you are and how you fit into the life of Reverend J.D. Jackson, Sr.? I'm Karen Summers. Um, I was the organist at Mount Vernon. Uh, I was the teacher in the city school district for 31 years. Oh, wow. And I retired from that. 
So how did you come to meet Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr.? Well, I was a member of the church when he came. Uh, he was called in, in the late 60s. So I was there when uh, he was called to be the pastor. And um, I was also the organist at the church, so we kind of worked closely together as far as the music was concerned. Oh, okay. So what was your first thoughts about him when you had a chance to actually work directly with him? I was very impressed with Reverend Jackson. I, I thought he was a very kind man. I thought he took an interest in the church and in the community. So yes, I liked him very much. Now, what did you think when you found out that the church was bombed? Oh, I was devastated. <laughs> um, and very selfishly, my first thought was my organ. Oh my God. <laughs> but it survived. Mm. But uh, I really was devastated about the church because it, it just didn't make any sense as to who would do something like that. And how did the Reverend respond? Do you remember his reaction when he found out the church was bombed? Um, I really don't remember his reaction. I remember that the church itself was just devastated. And he did say that we were going to rebuild. And I remember him saying that. He said, this is not going to stop us. We will rebuild. It took a while, but we did. And how was the church after it was rebuilt? Oh, it was wonderful. Um, I can remember we held services while the church was being rebuilt. We held services at the Seventh Day Adventist Church in on uh, Jefferson Avenue, and we also held services at Antioch. After they finished their morning service, we would have our service. But uh, when he announced that the church was going home, it was just a wonderful feeling. Oh, wow. Now, if you can think of three words that would describe Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr., what would those three words be? I would say that he was strong, he was compassionate, and he was giving. Um, we always had students from Colgate, Rochester Divinity School in our pulpit, and he always opened the doors for them to come in and do their field work. Oh, wow. So what else would you like to add to this story that you think many of us may not know? Oh, there are so many things. Reverend Jackson was just, he was a pillar of the community. I mean, everybody looked up to Reverend Jackson. Um, he, he was just, like I said, he was compassionate and he cared about people. And he would, he would, do things. I think he did a lot of things that nobody knew that he did mm. for people. So he was just he was just a great person. Thank you for joining me. Could you tell me who you are? So my name is Bobby Wright. And what's your connection to the Reverend J. D. Jackson Sr.? So my connection to Reverend J. D. Jackson Sr. began when I moved to Rochester in 1974. Uh, I came to Rochester from Tennessee after spending some time at Tennessee State University and the University of Illinois doing graduate work. So I moved here in 1974. Uh, I got married in 1975 to my wife Agnes. We have one son, Kyle, who lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, like I said, but in 1974, that's once I began working for Xerox. I started asking colleagues of mine uh, what would be a good church to attend in Rochester. I mentioned the Black Baptist Church, possibly. Uh, I guess that was my preference, rather. And uh, a colleague mentioned Mount Vernon Baptist Church at the time. And so uh, several weeks after hearing that, I decided to attend a service there. But again, um, service there was not being held at the regular location. The regular location of Mount Vernon was on Joseph Avenue, but back in 1971, the church was bombed. So the church is now holding its services at uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is on Jefferson Avenue. So I uh, visited 
the church on Jefferson Avenue. I found the people there to be warm and caring, and made some friends, and uh, I like the worship service. I was introduced to Reverend Jackson by some of the uh, members there. Uh, a very nice person, a very pleasant person to be around. So I enjoyed it. So all of those things, things led me to continue to come. So I continued to come over and over and over again, although I was not a member. And as I said, I got married one year later to my wife, Agnes, who's also a Tennessean, and she relocated to Rochester also. And so after she uh, arrived, we both started attending Mount Vernon on a regular basis, although we were, still were not members. And we waited until uh, the church decided to go back to his normal location on Joseph Avenue, which is in the spring of 1977. And following that, Agnes and I uh, both decided that we would join the church. And so I then be, you know, began to uh, know Reverend Jackson a little bit more because we were now members. And uh, he had asked me to serve on some committees. I did. And he even asked me to chair a special event called Men's Day, which is like an annual event at the church. He did. And later on, uh, because he knew that I had a financial, financial background, he asked if I would consider uh, becoming a member of the Board of Trustees, if he would recommend me and if the church would approve. And I said, I would. So he did recommend me. The church did approve. And at that point, I became a member of the Board of Trustees. And, uh, it was good work, uh, sometimes very hard work, uh, but it was good work. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being able to make a contribution to the church. Uh, so I, and I worked on several other projects with Reverend Jackson during that time period. Uh, I discovered that uh, he certainly had great trust in God, but he also had trust in me. So uh, he had, you know, if I would give him a recommendation or he would ask me some, some what, he, what I thought about some things and. I would give him my opinions, and he trusted my, 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 my opinions. Now, could you tell us something we may not know about the Reverend? Sure. Uh, the Reverend uh, J.D. Jackson Sr. Uh, loved uh, young people. He had an affinity for young ministers or young students who were in the, studying in the ministry. Uh, he had a great connection with Colgate Divinity School. Uh, I think his nephew had gone there, Bobby, uh, Bobby, Reverend Bobby Saucer, and along with some other people in, in the late 60s. But uh, this was in the 70s, and uh, as I said, he had a great connection with Colgate. And many of the students at Colgate would gravitate toward Mount Vernon because they understood that uh, he had an affinity for young students. He wanted to help them. And it was not uncommon or unusual to find two or three students each Sunday sitting in the pulpit there with, 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 uh, with Reverend Jackson. Uh, he gave them a chance to, to practice their craft. To, pra to practice their craft, he allowed them to preach on Sunday mornings. And uh, so I think they had an affinity for him, he had an affinity for them. And uh, eventually I think they gave him, I think they all gave him the nickname of Papa Jack or Papa Jackson. And I think even to, even to this day, well, many of them are a little bit older now, but they still remember him or refer to him as Papa Jack or Papa Jackson. So uh, he, was, he, he was a person that really, really, really enjoyed working with the young students at Colgate. When JD contacted you regarding him filming something on his father, why did you decide you wanted to be a part of this story? Okay, well, uh, for the reasons I probably have already hinted at. Uh, he was a, a very caring person. He cared about his church. He cared about his uh, family. He cared about his members. He cared, he cared, he was a very caring person. So I thought uh, a person who has that kind of a reputation and was, had those kind of qualities, uh, he would be it wouldn't be good if I would not share my experiences with Reverend Jackson about concerning Reverend Jackson. So I was more than willing to share my experiences with him. Is there anything else you want to add to this? Well, again, I think that uh, uh, 
in addition to the caring aspect of it, uh, Reverend Jackson was also a person that was involved. He was involved. Uh, many people may not realize, but he was involved very much in the community. I think he even served as a chaplain for the for the jail system in Rochester for a while. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also involved. Uh, we, my brother is a part of what we call the Great Lakes Baptist Association. I believe he was a moderator of that organization for some time. So uh, he did a lot of good things. Hello, Bobby. Hi, how are you? I'm well. So for people who are watching, could you tell me who you are? I am the nephew of the late Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr. Oh, okay. Now, what exactly can you tell us about the Reverend J.D. Jackson that we may not know? Well, first of all, uh, he uh, is my uncle, my mother's sister. He arranged for my ordination after I graduated with the first degree from Colgate Rochester. That was in July of uh, uh, 68. Until I graduated from high school, I typed his sermons every week from the eighth grade until the uh, until uh, high school graduation. And I grew up hearing about his experiences as a college student at Bishop College, and especially his professor, the late Dr. J, uh, Jesse J. McNeil. Now, what do you remember the most about the Reverend? <laughs> That's interesting. One of the things that was always funny for me, the more I, the more I uh, achieved educa educationally, he would always say in public that that's my nephew who has more, more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> so he sounds like he was a comedian. Uh, he had a sense of humor, but he, he was not a comedian as much as a very, very astute observer. Mm. Now, were you around during the time of the bombing of the church? I was indeed. In fact, I uh, came to Rochester uh, before he was called to Mount Vernon Baptist Church. That day of the bombing? Uh, well, I was in Rochester the day of the bombing and subsequent. Oh, okay. Okay. So you were there before the bombing. Did you work at the church or no, did you attend I, the church? I, I attended the church, but remember I was a, a seminarian at Colgate Rochester Crozier. And so uh, I was uh, always in and out of, of the church. But at the time I was a student, uh, uh, student minister at a Presbyterian church on the other side of town. So what do you remember most about the day of the bombing? You got me, I, I can't, look, I just turned 80, I can't remember that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us something that you remember. Um, what do you miss the most about the Reverend? Well, let, let me answer that. Pre previous question. Okay. What I remember most about the bombing is the uh, Muslim owned a restaurant next to Mount Vernon Church, and they were having uh, a, a strike between the fashions. And when they bombed the restaurant, Mount Vernon was also bombed. Mm. So I do remember that. Okay. Now, if you could describe the Reverend in, let's say, three words, what are the three words that come to mind? He was very scholarly, very disciplined, and he taught me ab about being serious about preparation for ministry. 
And he said to me, this is more than three words, but he said, if it's worth preaching to people, it's worth preparation. Now, for those who will never meet Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr., could you tell us something that you think the world should know about this man? Well, uh, I don't know how much you know about Louisiana and ministers and churches, but before coming to Rochester, he pastored four churches. Uh, two of them were Macedonia Baptist churches one in Monroe and the other one in Rayville, Louisiana. Then he pastored uh, another church, Mount Pleasant. And before that, he had been pastor of a church in Shreveport. So uh, he was quite experienced as a, as a minister and as, as a pastor. Now, is there anything else you want to add or you think we should discuss? Well, the one attribute that he had, he was excellent as a so, uh, singer and a soloist. None of that, even though his, my mama and his family were all very good singers, but it passed me up totally. <laughs> now, I have a couple of brothers who could sing, but that, that, didn't, that gift did not walk, fall, fall on me. Okay, so first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining me. Could you tell me who you are? <laughs> sure, my name is Arcola Jones. I am um, the youngest child and only daughter of Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr. Oh, okay. So I guess that answers the question of how you're connected to <laughs> Reverend J.D. Jackson Sr. <laughs> yeah. So growing up, how was it being the daughter of such a great man? Um, wow. I, the first, I guess the first thought that comes to mind was pretty normal, right? I, you hear all these horror stories about um, preachers' kids and, um, you know, the strictness and, and those kinds of things. Um, my father allowed us to, to still be children or youth, if you will, and and, um, and attend functions with our friends and, and, and do all those things that I guess, you know, normal kids would do. Um, however, you know, the majority of our childhood and, and lives were spent in church. So many of our closest friends were, were friends who were um, a, part of our, a part of our church. That was our family. So could you tell me something about your father that you remember vividly? Um, Gosh, there's so many memories, Shanique. Um, preaching, um, teaching. Um, when, one of the most memorable things for me, I think, is um, his laughter. Um, my, fa my father would tell a joke and he'd laugh through the whole punchline, you'd miss it. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that, was, that was just one of his, his things. He, he loved to laugh and, and just loved people. So were you around when the church was bombed? I was. I was um, very, very small at the time. Um, the church was bombed in 1971. Um, so I was huh, a toddler, if sort of, <laughs> around that time. <laughs> um, but I do still, at, you know, during the, the time of the remodel and, and rebuild, I do remember um, attending or going to the the church grounds with my father and and walking through the you know the damaged um, rubble, if you will, and um, and even um, you know as as we started to remodel, just watching it come come back to life. Now, how did your brother J.D. Jr. tell you that he was? that he decided to do a documentary on your father. What did he say? Hmm. Um, he just called me one day and said um, that, um, I think originally the thought was to have a commemorative service. And because of all of, with all of the things that are going on in the world with COVID and, 
and um, and everything. It just didn't seem practical to do such. And so um, he came up with this idea to to do this documentary. And he just said, um, you know, these people are going to call you. <laughs> so just be on the lookout for um, for a phone call so that they can set up an interview. And um, and I said, that's wonderful. And OK, let's do it. Yes. So what do you think about your brother? What is your, <laughs> I know that's a crazy question, but what do you, like all of the stuff he's accomplished, everything he's doing, what are your, you know, what are your thoughts about your, he's your big brother, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I think it's awesome. I think that, you know, he's, um, he is, he is certainly walking, uh, walking the path that my father laid for us and, um, and he's making a difference in the Rochester community, which is, you know, which is our hometown. I think, you know, the things that he's done even around um, memorializing Frederick Douglass are are monumental, um, and so he is he is most certainly putting or keeping the um, the Jackson name or J D Jackson name alive. So I'm I'm inspired by him. I I love him. Um, that's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you think we should know about your father, your brother, or even you? Wow. Um, Hmm. I guess collectively, um, we're a family of people who, who love God. We love people. Um, my, my father's legacy, you know, lives on through us. I think, um, just in the way that, that we, we deal with people in the way that, um, the way that we love on people, um, and the way that we, we aim to, to make a difference in the lives of others. Um, I currently serve as um, as a mentor for undergraduate adult um, business students, and and it's not just a job; it's a calling for me. Um, you know, I get I get to to change people's lives, and and um, I think that I believe that's what I'm here for, and I believe that's what they're here they were here for. Right. Now, is there anything else you want to add or think we missed? Um. My mom is also a great woman of God. Um, I think that, you know, as being being raised or reared, if you will, by a, a pastor and, and a teacher um, certainly had had its benefits and um, and and their legacy lives through us again. Um, you know, my mom is is even in her 80s is still very spry and still helping other people <laughs> and doing for other people. And, um, and I think, again, that's, that's just who we are and, and what, we were, what we were put on this earth to do. In what ways are you continuing the legacy of your father? Well, as you know, I am a, a junior and uh, my son is also um, named after my dad. He's the third. Um, I think in just my, my daily living, um, just making sure that I'm <laughs> not putting mud on the name that's continuing the legacy. Um, but, uh, you know, all of us have a uh, need for ways to um, have doors open for us. You know, doors don't fly open, you know, just automatically. But um, my dad had a, a great name that, you know, I am privileged to, you know, have doors open because people know who my dad is, as time passes, you know, people tend to, to forget, you know, there's a street renamed after my dad. And uh, people these days will say, you know, do you have a street renamed after you? <laughs> it's like, uh, no, that's not me, that's my dad. So that's a way for a, a segue to say, you know, okay, this is my dad and this is what he did. This was what he was about. So anytime anybody drives down Joseph Avenue, uh, which is Reverend J.D. Jackson Senior Way also, um, they have to question who is that you know um, they, they may you know think it's jesse jackson but you know they'll still ask the question and um that brings up another important uh, thing to me um jesse jackson's son had a um saying where he talked about you know people always saying you know oh you're writing on your dad's name you're writing on your dad's name and he said you know i'm thankful that my dad gave me a name that I can ride on. And that's my, my story too. I am happy that my dad 
left a legacy that, you know, opens doors for me, opens doors for my son, and, you know, who knows what that'll mean in the future. But um, I'm very proud of, of my dad, and hopefully I'm living up to the legacy he left. This year is the 100th year anniversary of your grandfather's birth. Yes. Did you know that? He would have been 100 years old. October 29th. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? I mean, so I looked on my schedule and I saw it there. I'm like, wow. That's, I, did, I didn't know exactly what it was. 100th birthday? Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Yeah. It was just 100th anniversary of something. Okay. But I didn't know it was his birthday. All right. And you knew, right? Uh, uh, I saw yeah. the calendar too, like before we started. Okay. All right. Well, we were going to have like a big event over it in Mount Vernon. And I don't know. I mean, you guys have been there, you know, a few times in your youth, mm -hmm. you know, with all of the things going on with the pandemic and everything. But of course, nobody's been over there. But just wanted to uh, find out from you guys, like, what exactly you really knew. Because we're not going to have an event this year, but we'll probably do something significant, you know record something to share with, with other people, you know, family members and what have you. But I dug up some of these books with a lot of history on it. I didn't know if you guys knew what Mount Vernon looked like even before what you see now. But that's a book from 1977. Um, the church, Mount Vernon, was bombed um, back in 1971. Uh, you knew about that, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know about the, the bombing? I didn't at all. <laughs> okay. I had no clue. All right. Well, yeah, it was bombed back in 1971. Um, still unsolved today. Uh, they don't know uh, why or um, who, who uh, decided to do that, but um, it was bombed. But they moved back to the same location like six years later. So that's why they produced that book with all of the history in there. Your grandfather was pastor of Mount Vernon that whole time uh, while they were uh, meeting other places. They met over at the Seventh Day Adventist Church over on Jefferson Avenue, down the street from my church, uh, down the street from Trinity. So that, that's the site I, I need to take you all to just down the street the next time we go to, to Trinity. But um, of course, you know, the street is renamed for, for your grandfather. And uh, that was done by David Gant, uh, who's now deceased. He's another prominent individual here in Rochester. And in one of these books, it even sh shows the, uh, it may have the been timeline. In there, Andre. Yeah. It may have been in there. No, it's this one. Huh? Yeah, yeah there's oh. David Gant right there. Okay, see right here? Yes. Trey, there's David Gant with your grandfather. Mm -hmm. But now, yeah. JD, you didn't tell them. Now, before you went over to the street where your church is, we met at Antioch, the church right next door to Mount Vernon. Right, right across the street. Uh huh. We met there. And our first meeting, we met over on North Street. Holy City. Yes. So I think that was the first place that we met after this bombing. After the bombing, Holy City opened their church doors. So we went there. From there, we came back to Antioch. And from Antioch, then we went to the Seven Day Adventist. Yeah, Jefferson Avenue. So we stayed at the Seven Day Adventist Church. Oh, it was a number of years before we went back to the old site there at Mount Vernon. And during that time, um, on Saturday mornings, your granddad would call some of the members to the back of the bomb church to pray. And he was saying to them that we will be back to this site, but what we're going to do, we're going to pray that things work out whereas we can come back to this site. And sure enough, we did go back. 
1976 or 77. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I, can't I can't remember the year yeah. either. But anyway, what we did, we marched from Antioch to the Mount Vernon site. Then when we marched from from Antioch back to Mount Vernon, we went in, they had service, and we've been having service ever since. Up until the, the COVID. pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some COVID has stopped things. Yeah, COVID again has for people at home. But yeah. But all during this time when the church was bombed, they were still um, able to meet at different locations because of the, the good graces and kindness of the, the Rochester community and other pastors that your uh, dad was, your grandfather was um, <laughs> friends with. So it shows you some things. But even prior to him coming to um, Mount Vernon, he came to Mount Vernon in 1966. There's other history. Mm -hmm. uh, Monroe, Louisiana, that's where he came from. You guys were down there for family reunions, but uh, some of these uh, are from his previous church. Yeah, now this was this was his church there in in uh, Rayville, a place called Rayville. And this was this church was Macedonia Baptist Church. And what I what we say, you were born during that time. A couple of years later. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If... So we brought you. So your granddad and I brought your dad here. A one-year-old child. Did he grow up in that church? Oh, uh, well, what? JD was born while we were down in Monroe, and we came here in '66. So what? Dad was a baby. Your aunt was born shortly after here in Rochester. In '67. All right, so um, what do you want to know about your grandfather now that you uh, found out this other information about the bombing and you know, his close ties to prominent people in Rochester? So what, what was the difference in his personality between when he was outside in the community and when he was back at home? You want to take that one? Go on. <laughs> All right, well, I, I would say he was more a lot like my, my personality. And that, uh, right. you know, it, it's more uh, quiet at home, reserved at home. But uh, when he was out in the community, you know, he definitely let his uh, voice be heard. You know, and he, he was respected for that. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, he was uh, more of a, a solid um, persona. You find a lot of other people that are, you know, more flamboyant, you know, uh, like James Brown will say, talking loud and saying nothing. That wasn't him. Anything that he would would say was of, of uh, significance. You know, it's like he, he thought it out. It wasn't, um, you know, he wouldn't just talk. Um, he would have have a, a thought behind anything. Anything he said had some meaning to it. So that was just the way he carried himself. But your thoughts. He was highly yeah. respected by the community. At least say, lots of times there were things that people would say, you know, we would love to hear Reverend Jackson's view on that. Why not invite him for this? And he was able to go and there, there were things that went on in the community that, that they, they really respected what he had to say about it. Whereas, like your dad said, there were some other people that would come out and they would just go with a lot of nothing. Whatever he had to say, you left with a better feeling about it. Yeah. And there were controversial things that mm -hmm. would happen in, in the community, you know. And uh, again, just like what you see today with a lot of things going on, you know. People take one side or the other, you know, that, that that's nothing new, but he would be kind of the stable voice, almost the mediator at times. You know, there, 
yeah, I, I won't go into all of the, the major details, <laughs> but there, there were uh, things that would happen in the community where uh, churches, um, congregations, and the pastor would be at odds. They're like, okay, uh, pastor, if you support this, <laughs> you're out of here. That kind of thing. And then, you know, uh, your grandfather, uh, it would be like, okay, we want to really know what your thoughts are. And he would go not only at Mount Vernon, but to other places and kind of smooth the waters, if you will, um, to, to keep peace at, at other places. And again, I'm trying not to get too deep into- That's right, you know, don't uh, get into- Naming names, names or anything, but yeah. Right. But, but uh, some of uh, the things that could have been a little more volatile in, in our community. Or there the were the some piece things being that... kept, you can attribute <laughs> to your grandfather. Uh -huh. We'll put it that way. So, like you had said, there were some things that went on in churches. There were things that went on between, um, I would say, certain people. And they would call. We need to get Reverend Jackson here. Yeah. Because we feel that he could smooth the waters. And most of the time, he did. Yeah. yeah, and after he got sick, um, Reverend Cherry kind of took that role. Uh -huh. um, people would call on Reverend Cherry to uh, do the same thing. So, like I said, con controversy <laughs> and division and all kinds of things that you see going on now, that, that's nothing new. You know, and I'm sure it was probably going on before, before he was around. So... Any other thoughts you got? <laughs> Questions? I guess, uh, what, what was he like talking about work at home? Like when, when he got home from, or like accomplishing something big or when he was working on it, did he have a level of enthusiasm or how'd you guys take it? Um, I, I, I think it was an outlet at home you know, where he's the, the calm voice <coughs> out in the community. It's like, okay, he knew that he could come home and um, it was his place of retreat. So he could talk to mom or talk to, to us, you know, he would be very vocal when he needed to be. He would have his moments where he would be in his office and, you know, quiet, you wouldn't even know he was here. But if there was like something that was, uh, you know, troubling him, needed to get out you would you would know it and I and I think that's what most people need just for a healthy balance in, in life he, he maintained that because he had an outlet of his family being able to say you know okay well this went on you know I would have liked to have choked whoever <laughs> but I didn't <laughs> but no you know uh, that, that's just a, a silly example but again when you're dealing with that um, large of a congregation you're gonna have people that are going to try you, whether it's intentional or not, they will try you. Um, you know, because for myself, I, I never wanted to be a pastor. Just watching some of the things your grandfather had to deal with, uh, with, with congregation that large, it was just something else. But but he, he maintained it. So, I mean, being in this role myself now, he gets all the credit for... <laughs> Um, being able to to navigate that so, phenomenal person you know, sometimes when you're in it you don't see what the, the forest for the trees but I really admire him for being able to, to do what he did so um, so I heard that Mount Vernon was the second <coughs> big black church mm -hmm. in Rochester <laughs> And I think Enon was the first one. How did they compare to you? How did they like? Um, well, both pastors, uh, your grandfather and um, Reverend Cherry were good friends. And his predecessor, Reverend Greer, um, they were all friends. And the, it was like, they, they called them the three musketeers. So it would be uh, Reverend Cotton over at, at Antioch, right across the street. And then uh, Reverend Greer at Enon and then uh, Reverend Cherry, who, who uh, followed him. Uh, they would be everywhere together. 
you know, I think they'd have breakfast on Saturdays uh, regularly. And, uh, you know. And whenever there were meetings, they would even ride together. Yeah. It would yes. be a thing like, hey, one of the cars, who, who's going to drive this time? And but the three of them would get together yeah. to go. Yeah, it's the, the Great Lakes Association. Yeah, and, and there was have... another one, uh, Reverend Long. Okay. Uh, Reverend Long used to be with them. Okay. Now, he had one of the, the small churches. He was like the uh, pastor at Peace Baptist. Right. And after he passed away, then there was Reverend, um, what was the other? Short. Harvey? Reverend Harvey. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, the, but again, they um, were all members of what they call the Great Lakes Association, which right. was like Buffalo, uh, Rochester, Niagara, Niagara Falls. Falls. So they would be traveling all the time, you know, to these Great Lakes uh, associations. And your uh, grandfather was the moderator of that. So um, he's not only known here in Rochester and Monroe, Louisiana, but, you know, through this Tri-City uh, upstate New York area. So you, know, you, you can go to Niagara Falls and say your name, you know, you being the third. <laughs> you say your Julius D. Jackson. The they're third. Gonna, they're going to look at you a little funny, like, I know of one. Are you related to him? Uh -huh. Yeah. So don't be surprised if one day, you know, you're you somewhere, somewhere and somebody <laughs> recognizes the name. Yeah. That's a name that it carries a little weight still. And even, even after the Great Lakes, there was also the Empire State Convention that Daddy held. Um, what I know he taught in the Empire State for a good while. Yeah. So from Great Lakes through the Empire State, you're going to hear a lot about Reverend J.D. Jackson. And they'll probably say from Mount Vernon Baptist Church. Yeah, because even with him being gone for, you know, like 21 years now, I'm still amazed at the people who still um, speak so highly of him. Like, you know, there'll never be a pastor like Reverend Jackson. That's so, right. Oh, that's, that's pretty nice. Yeah.